Thank you first for the very kind introduction. <laughs> uh, that's a quite unusual uh, introduction, so I'm not so used to that. Um, so thank you very much, Luigi. Uh, I wish also to thank the organizing committee for having given me the chance to, uh, to be here and talk to you. Uh, as you will see, I have prepared something especially for you, which is a perhaps a lecture more than a keynote, and uh, it's been prepared especially for this purpose. Uh, perhaps it's been prepared a little bit in the spirit of what uh, our father, Giovanni Solari, would have done, and uh, I really enjoyed the way he was uh, putting uh, different arguments in a very pedagogical manner, and uh, I hope I try to, at least I try to do uh, something kind of similar today. And, uh, and so I will address the question of envelope reconstruction with the uh, equivalent wind loads. All right, but first, just to set up the, uh, the exact uh, environment in which we are going to work, I will write and pass again the, wor <laughs> the word to, uh, to Luigi for a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Vincent. Well, what is the idea behind equivalent wind loads? The idea is to replace a complicated load with something simple, something that we can calculate, we can manage simply and uh, must be equivalent in some way. So, produce the same effect of that. But uh, the framework is complicated because a load can be static or dynamic, can be deterministic or random, stationary or transient. And we want to compare that with something in which terms? Uh, equivalent to what? Global forces, maybe displacement field, maybe is the most common uh, choice, uh, stress, uh, damage, fatigue, and so on. And to start with, uh, and frame the problem, we start with a very simple case, static and deterministic, and uh, is what we teach to our undergraduate students. We have a load, we load our truck with something, and maybe we apply also another action, an acceleration. And we say that, we teach them that they can substitute these two conditions with uh, a single force, and hopefully this single force provides the same effect of the combined load. And we did a good job, we can prevent a failure. Mm. But the situation becomes more complicated when we have dynamics, when we have randomness. And indeed, dynamic response and randomness are the features that we usually try to replace when we include, uh, when, we, when we deal with equivalent static loads. And uh, it is exactly the topic uh, and uh, exactly uh, the issue that uh, will be addressed in the, uh, in the next 45 minutes by Vincent. So, please. All right. So, this just sets the, the, the context in which we are going to work. So, try to replace complex dynamic loads into static equivalent forces. And uh, we're going to address this question in the context of the buffeting analysis of structures. So there are typically two different ways in which we can uh, determine the pressures on uh, complex shaped structures. The first approach is based on wind tunnel testing, the other one is based on CFD. Uh, of course, you, you know these uh, different techniques. And uh, in each of them, we measure pressures at pressure taps, which vary, of course, in time, and they would create responses in the structures, displacement, reaction forces, or stresses in the structure. And uh, what we would like to do is determine equivalent forces such that when we apply them on the structure, we recover the same maximum displacement. For what reason do we do this? Well, first, for codification purposes. That's one of the objectives. But mostly, mostly and perhaps more importantly, because the design engineers, they need to combine the wind loads with many other loads, no loads or dead loads whatsoever, in many different combinations. And so it's important to, to keep things simple. So the first part of my presentation will be uh, devoted to equivalent static wind loads. And then once we have discussed or reviewed this uh, basic ingredient, then we will see how we can use them in order to solve another problem, which is called the envelope reconstruction problem. All right, so to start, it's difficult to skip the concept of gust response factor, with which we are all, I think, very familiar. And just to review a little bit uh, of this concept, the way it works is that we imagine we have a single degree of freedom system. Very simple, this is how it started. Uh, it is subjected to a force that is supposed to be known or measured or computed in a CFD. 
And uh, this will activate the dynamics of the single degree of freedom system. So basically, we solve the equation of motion, compute a response. In this case, the only response I'm interested in is the displacement. We can compute it over time, take the maximum value. This is a target. This is what I would, li would like to recover. So find a static force such that when I apply this in a static manner, I recover exactly the same displacement. Simple enough, if you know the stiffness, if you know the force, uh, sorry, if you know the stiffness and the maximum response, just take the product, this is the equivalent force. Unfortunately, in our daily business, the job of the wind engineer and the job of the structural engineer are typically split. And the wind engineer usually, usually doesn't care too much about the stiffness. And so we like to see whether it's possible or not to avoid the stiffness. And so at these early stages of the derivation of equivalent static wind loads, there were a bit of mathematics done in such a way that you can split average, uh, sorry, maximum value into average plus fluctuation, a very simple peak factor times standard deviation. And then over the mathematics, you just uh, observe that the, maximum, the, the equivalent static force can be expressed as a, a gust response uh, factor multiplied by uh, the average value. And that's, of course, great, because the wind engineer who measures forces knows the average force and can just amplify it, and the problem is solved. Is it solved? No, it starts from a simple example, so we can't really generalize. If I take another example, uh, which is a balanced cantilever bridge, for instance, I would like to compute or recover uh, the uh, torsional rotation of this simple structure. Of course, uh, you will understand uh, quite quickly that if the two forces, F1, F2, have the same average, but they are slightly different in time, of course, because they are slightly different in time, this will generate a rotation of the deck. Uh, and if we want to replace them by two equivalent forces in the same way, uh, Fe2, Fe1 need to satisfy this condition. And unfortunately, if they both have the same average, you can't define these as the average multiplied by a gust response factor. Otherwise, there is no uh, maximum rotation. All right, so to use uh, something proportional to the average field doesn't work anymore. Or what we need to keep in mind, of course, is that this method doesn't work or it fails when we have zero average or small average. But it's not a big deal. We can use any other couple of values, Fe2, Fe1, that would be such that this relation is satisfied. So we have many possible combinations. And uh, the problem, unfortunately, is not closed. And uh, this is my second message today. If you want to define equivalent static wind loads, there is not a single unique solution to the problems, not in all cases. In order to solve this, what you could do, think that you want to reconstruct also the displace, transverse displacement, so use some sort of bending stiffness, use a second equation. In that case, the problem is properly solved. All right, uh, so we are happy. Two loads, two responses. Problem is, is properly closed. Engineers are very happy. But again, this is an example, and this is not because it works for a simple example that it would work in any case. So we can consider other, another example again. This is the last simple example I'm going to use. Uh, this is the same single degree of freedom structure, but we decided to model it with two degrees of freedom. Why? Well, I don't know. That's something we do every day anyways. You build a huge finite element model with thousands of degrees of freedom, but at the end of the day, the complexity of the structure is maybe just five, ten modes. And so this is something that, that resembles reality. And so if we assume, uh, oops, sorry for this, it has moved a bit. If we assumed that x2 is half of x1 at any time, this is indeed, in fact, just a single degree of freedom uh, system. And if you want to solve the same problem, then the problem that was well posed before turns out to be ill posed. So it means that we perhaps need uh, some mathematical de definition, uh, which would be a bit more, uh, a bit more accurate. And so uh, how do we define equivalent static wind loads? Well, the problem is the following one. So we have a measured wind field, pressure field or forces on a structure. We can analyze the structure, determine displacements, and then combine them. In this case, this is a linear combination, but we could discuss later what would happen if it was a nonlinear combination, for instance, computation of von Mises stresses, in order to obtain responses. The uh, time evolution of the responses, we keep the maximum. This is the target we want to reconstruct. And so the thing we want to do is to find an equivalent force such that we apply it in a static manner. We compute equivalent displacement, recombine them, and obtain the maximum uh, responses. If we substitute here xe in that equation, we see that 
we end up with a simple equation, which is a matrix. This is a matrix we've seen already in a couple of presentations during the conference uh, that multiplies equivalent forces to recover the envelope. This is a simple algebraic problem. It could be solved. And we have seen in the previous examples that when this matrix is squared, we have as many responses as the number of forces we are looking for, and the problem could be determined. But we have also seen that it could be undetermined, and it could also be overdetermined. So there are many, many different possibilities. And, uh, uh, and this is a reason why there are many different ways to define equivalent static wind loads. All right. Um, so the gust response factor um, is quite similar to this. In fact, the first, question get, that, the first answer that can be uh, given to that question is to focus on the wind flow only. So we disregard totally the dynamics. So we forget about equation of motion, and we can do some statistical treatment of the pressures that are applied on the structure. And if we follow a little bit the spirit of the gust response factor, we could say, OK, let's assume the equivalent forces that we want are proportional to the average wind field or average pressure field. That's one option. Second well-known option is what is called the CPT, or covariance proper transformation, in which we could decompose with an eigenvalue decomposition. We could decompose the covariance matrix of the pressure field or of the forces. That's just a simple way if you want to condense the information and take uh, the uh, most important features of the loading. They are gathered uh, into eigenvectors, which correspond to loading modes and eigenvalues. If we keep only the largest eigenvalues, they are sorted from largest to the top uh, left to smallest to the bottom right. If we keep only the first large, largest eigenvalues, we can summarize the loading with those uh, type of loads. Uh, but uh, this is not it, and uh, there were so many, uh, some other solutions given to the, to the problem. One of the most famous, and I think this was really a pioneering work in the, in the process of equivalent static wind loads, is the load response correlation. Uh, this is a method that was uh, initially set up in the, in the 1990s uh, with uh, the works of, of Holmes and those, of course, who also have been done in, uh, in Bochum. And so uh, the way it works is to uh, assume that there is uh, no dynamics. So we disregard in this approach the fact that the structure could perhaps vibrate, and we assume that everything behaves in a memoryless manner, in a static manner. So it means that every single time, the displaced configuration of the structure just depends on the forces at that time. This is what this equation here states. So it means we don't really have to bother anymore about expressing responses as a function of displacement, we can express them right away as a function of the applied forces. It's kind of the same. Notice here that I just kept one response, because in the spirit of what has been done or what had been done at that time, people were just considering one, one response at a time. Uh, I skip the details, because this is not so much important. We can keep them here just for the reference. Uh, just keep in mind that this method first assumes that the, the structure behaves in a static manner. Second, uh, that everything is Gaussian, so both the responses and both the loads. And third, assumes also that we have the same peak factor, so, this, so that we can reconstruct the, the envelope with the same peak factor everywhere. And what it says, it just says that the equivalent load response correlation force, forces that you need to apply in order to recover a certain, let's say, displacement somewhere, is expressed as a product of the correlation coefficient between that displacement and the measured force multiplied by the maximum force you're interested in. It actually corresponds, this can be demonstrated, I don't want to show it here anymore, uh, it corresponds in fact to the most probable measured force corresponding to occurrence of the maximum displacement or the maximum response you're interested in. So the method, and I think this is really why it was famous, has a very simple physical interpretation. And it's been translated into what is called conditional sampling technique, where, in a very simple manner, if you have measurement in a wind tunnel, you measure forces at different pressure taps. This is just one example of one pressure. You compute responses, so the displacement in the structure by solving uh, the, solving the, the, the response of the structure. And what it says is that when the structure or the response reaches its maximum value, just look at how much was the uh, applied force. And that's just as simple as that. All right, so if these perhaps are 
negative aspects of the method. It has very interesting uh, positive uh, aspects. And the most important one, I guess, is the non-overshooting of the envelope. What does it mean? It means that if you define an equivalent static wind load in that manner, you apply it on the structure, and no matter the other responses you would like to look at, nowhere, nowhere you will find responses larger than those you would have obtained with the dynamic analysis. And that's super important. Under the three hypotheses I've given before, this can be demonstrated. It's a direct consequence of Cauchy-Schwarz's theorem. So this is something that is really, really solid. One drawback, however, uh, is that a load response correlation method, they would apply forces on a structure only where the forces have been measured in the wind tunnel, of course because we take those forces and we, we conditionally average them somehow. So there's no way to have forces anywhere else. And this is bad in some circumstances. For instance, if we imagine that this frame behaves in a dynamic manner, and its response is mostly a dynamic response, then its deformed configuration would not be like this one, which corresponds to a single applied load at mid-span with a given bending moment diagram. It would look like something that is more like this, because the deformed configuration would be the deformed configuration of a, a vibration mode. And so if you would like to recover that deformed configuration, the distribution of forces that you need to use is something that comes from this, and which is called modal inertial loads. And the corresponding bending moment diagram is shown here on the right. Consequences? Well, if you're interested in reconstructing, for instance, the bending moment in the top right corner, just over here, so you would define the equivalent static wind load here in such a way that you recover exactly the bending moment there, but in fact, you do a bad job because if you look at the actual bending moment that you would have at mid-span, it is actually 25% higher than uh, what you would normally have if the force, the equivalent force was exactly applied at that point. So the non-overshooting condition doesn't hold anymore. Why? Because, of course, we missed this important property, the first one I talked about, static response. If it's dynamic response, we lose this uh, important property. All right, and this is also just to say that if you work, if you're a design engineer, and if you work with wind tunnels or CFD guys providing equivalent static forces, you should not necessarily be uh, afraid to see that they would provide forces at other places of the structure than just those where they have measured forces, right? You could have a roof on a bigger structure, and the roof only is loaded, but in order to recover the right dynamic configuration, they would need to apply static forces elsewhere. All right, so don't be afraid of that. That's something that might happen. All right, so modal inertial loads came up almost at the same time. And uh, I'm sorry for the uh, floating, <laughs> floating s stuff sometimes. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, and so, so the assumption for the modal inertial load is that the displacement is proportional to a mode shape. So phi here is a mode shape, that's a magnitude. Or in very short, this is exactly what I've introduced before. You need to apply forces in a different sort of configuration in order to re uh, recover uh, the right deformation. It works for one mode, but it's also possible to extend to uh, multiple modes. Okay, so what we need to keep in mind for the moment is that we have two different techniques. Load response correlation, modal inertial loads. The first one works for background response, so when the structure behaves in a static manner somehow. The other one works perfectly when this is dynamic. And so it means that the first one works when the power spectral density of the response looks like this, you see background, and the other one like this, resonant. Unfortunately, in uh, our daily business, power spectral densities of anything we look at in real structures is something that is more like this. So a little bit later, what happened? We had a few other uh, techniques which aimed at combining uh, these, two, uh, these two simple methods. And the way it works is to define equivalent static wind loads by weighting the static wind loads coming from the load response correlation and the uh, uh, equivalent static wind loads coming from the modal inertial loads. And the weighting coefficients, WB, WR, are expressed somehow like this. And you can see, for instance, that if the response is fully background, so quasi-static only, this turns to be equal to 1, this turns to be equal to 0, and we recover the load response correlation. And the other way around, if the response is fully dynamic, we recover only modal inertial loads. So somehow we generalize the concept and make sure we have something that fits in those intermediate cases where we have a bit of, a bit of the, the two components in the response. 
Super interesting, because actually it will restore this non-overshooting property. So again, it's possible to demonstrate that if you use this sort of combination, there is no overshooting at all. Okay, I want to skip the fact that there were uh, different variants of uh, that method without model correlation, with model correlation, and some more advanced also uh, approaches. The one I will use in the, for the rest of this presentation is the one proposed by Shen and Karim, 2001, uh, using model correlation. Model correlation, why? Because the, I want to illustrate all those concepts with a very simple example, which has been designed just for the purpose of this talk and uh, in which we have a quite dense uh, density of natural frequencies, so modal correlation is just important. So the example is as basic as we could imagine. This is, a, this is something that would mimic somehow a viaduct, if you want. It's a seven-span viaduct, uh, almost equal spans. I just decided to take the, la the last span uh, slightly longer in order to create some this, uh, asymmetry in the structure. You see the mode shape is not perfectly symmetric. Uh, the wind loading, wind loading is super academic, very simple, so drag only, doesn't really make sense, but it's okay, uh, this is just for the purpose of the example. Uh, power spectral density uh, is borrowed from Eurocode, we have linear loading, so everything will be Gaussian, I want to be in the hypothesis of the problem. Uh, we have 84 finite elements all along the beam, so 85 different nodes. And uh, the analysis was carried out in the time domain simulation just to try to mimic what we could do in a wind tunnel. So it means that I generated a sample of the wind field, so the wind pressure, and then I did the analysis, time domain analysis of the structure, computed the displacement at mid-span over here, for instance, at mid-span over there, for instance, and this is the result that I would like to reconstruct with equivalent static forces. So what we could observe, if you look at the power spectral densities of those displacements, is that a response, this is a log scale, pay attention, this is a response that is mostly resonant. Um, and then I will, uh, in the following of this presentation, I will focus on some responses, and the responses I want to focus on are the displacement at each node of the model, so 85 displacements, and bending moments in the structure, at the same 85 locations. So in total, I have 170 responses that I would like to uh, reconstruct. And so based on the time series, of course, this is very simple to compute the standard deviation of the displacement everywhere or the bending moment everywhere. Uh, I assume zero mean to make it simple because the average field is something that can be discussed in a separate manner. I use to make it simple the same gust, uh, uh, sorry, the same peak factor. And uh, this allowed me to construct uh, these envelopes. Okay, so we have at every single section, maximum displacement, maximum bending moment. You recognize the typical shape of bending moments on, on supports where you have negative uh, bending moments. And I'm going to compare or present what we could do with the different uh, approaches. Okay, so first, CPT modes. Uh, the C CPT decomposition, so the covariance decom uh, decomposition of the pressure field, uh, would look like, like this. Uh, this is uh, quite standard. If you used to that, uh, you recognize four uh, shapes that you, you've already seen elsewhere. I want to focus on two of them. The first one, because it kind of, uh, it's kind of constant across the whole length of the structure, and this is also quite similar to what we would have with, with a gust response factor. It's quite similar to the average value. So in order to save a bit, a bit of time, I will discuss with this one only. And then I will also discuss it with this one because, uh, because this is a seventh CPT mode. It has seven wavelengths, uh, which is also equal to the number of uh, half waves we have in the mode shape. And if you apply the concept of double modal transformation, it would say that they fit. So uh, this is a combination that needs to be uh, taken into account. Let's assume we want to find the equivalent static forces that allows us to recover with a static analysis the displacement at the first mid-span. So to do so, I just assume this distribution of forces which corresponds to the first CPT mode, just scale it up and down in such a way that the displaced configuration passes exactly through, the, through that point. The corresponding bending moment diagram is the following. And what do we see? of course, significant overshooting. That's bad, because if you use that distribution of forces, of course, you will overestimate bending moments everywhere, and the quantity you give to the design engineer will be such that you use too much, uh, too much steel or concrete, for instance, to, concre to, to build uh, this bridge. A simple solution, if you're not happy with this overshooting over there, of course, multiply everything by 0 0.84 in such a way that this is now okay here, 
you could do it, but unfortunately, you haven't solved the problem here. You need to scale it down a little bit more, and then if you do that, you don't reconstruct things any, uh, everywhere uh, in a proper manner. So guest response uh, factor, of course, doesn't work for this structure. This is also well known. It's written on, in our standards. If the mode shapes changes sign, you should not use it. We could do the same with the second CPT mode, and uh, this, is, uh, this is what you would obtain. So with the uh, actual uh, value in uh, uh, solid line, this is what you have. And if you scale it down, you see you don't do uh, such a bad job uh, because you recover displacement and bending moments. I would say we, sh we should consider ourselves quite lucky in this case because keep in mind that the CPT decomposition is just based on the forces and it contains no information at all about the, the structure. All right, so um, let me keep going. Uh, let's do the same now with our combination. And if we do it with our combination, I'm trying here to reconstruct displacement in the second midspan. You look at that, this is beautiful. Everywhere what we reconstruct is inside the envelope and we are super happy with it. I could do the same in another point, which is this point. It's a bit more difficult, but still you see that we don't uh, have any overshooting problem. The distribution, of course, of the forces looks very realistic. Uh, so it could be understood as a, a realistic distribution of forces on a, on a deck. Uh, if we had used the load response correlation method only, this is what we would have obtained, 36% overshooting. I guess you all understood why. This is because the structure behaves in a dynamic manner and not in a static manner, and this is why there was overshooting. We could solve it also uh, with a uh, downscaling factor. Okay, provisional conclusion. Load response correlation, modal inertial loads, great tools. They need to be combined in order to make sure there is no overshooting in the envelope in any case. And it's also possible to extend. Uh, I'm gonna skip the next few slides, uh, which are part of the works we did uh, in the last years to explain that it's possible to uh, extend this combined version in other contexts, not only Gaussian uh, context, but also non-Gaussian uh, situations, and also partly with some sort of non-linearities in the structure. I would like to focus for the remaining of this talk, uh, I would like to focus on the envelope reconstruction problem. And so this is the second part of the, of the presentation. So now what we need to keep in mind is that we have in our hands tools to reconstruct responses at different places in a structure. And now let's see how we can use those in order to reconstruct the envelope. All right, so what we did is that we were able to determine a distribution of forces such that we recover the maximum displacement here. If we apply with a positive and negative sign, so we just flip it, this is the fraction of the envelope we are able to reconstruct with that load case only. We could have done the same for the first span. And so if you combine these two load cases, so you tell the design engineer, okay, you do the analysis with these two load cases and take the worst of the situation, this is what you would have recovered. Fair enough, you see that with regards to displacement, we did a good job, but there is still a bit of uh, something missing for the bending moment. So you could uh, just, for instance, decide that you want to use another equivalent static wind load, which is this one, the one that would recover the bending moment here. You see that this one has the same sign over the two adjacent spans. It makes sense, right? Because if you want to maximize the negative bending moment, you need to have the same sign for the, for the pressure on the two, uh, the two uh, adjacent spans. And this is what you will recover. Okay, let me just step back a little bit. If we keep going, use the third, then the fourth, then the fifth, six, seven, this is what we have reconstructed. And uh, we, should, we could stop here. Sometimes it happens, of course, when you solve those problems that you stop at a certain point, you need to stop somewhere. Uh, we would be happy because we reconstruct 91% of the envelope for the bending moment. Is it okay? Maybe yes, maybe not. I don't quite know. This is left to be, of course, and to be decided by the design engineers. Uh, but the message clearly is that don't try to reconstruct everything with displacements only because you could fail in reproducing the maximum uh, internal forces. Uh, by the way, I just anticipate that the reconstruction uh, metric that I use, so the ratio of these two surfaces, is just an indicator in this talk to show you how we do a good job, but in real life application it could depend also on the strength of the structure. 
So if the strength, for instance, that had been designed over there is super large, basically you don't really care if the equivalent static wind loads are a bit lower. All right, so the strength of the, of the structure, of course, should also be, in principle, involved into the, into the reasoning. If you decide to also add the six bending moments uh, on the supports, this is what you would reconstruct, and from 91%, now we go to 95.4. So did we do a good job? We used uh, 13 equivalent static wind loads. I think it's fair to wonder whether or not we did a good job. This is a progressive reconstruction of the envelope in terms of this metric. Uh, I've displayed this metric here, both for the displacement and for the bending moment. So you see that we started from one equivalent static wind load, where for the displacement we reconstructed about 35% of, the, of the, the envelope. After the first seven equivalent static wind loads, the reconstruction for the displacement was almost perfect. And then we added a few equivalent static wind loads re related to bending, the bending moment in order to increase from 91% to 90, 95%. Could we be more efficient? That's, of course, a question that is natural to ask. Why did we use 13? Could we use 12 instead? Or maybe 11, maybe 10? Because, of course, the design engineer doesn't want, to, doesn't want to use too many load cases. Keep in mind, this is a very simple example, but your real-life example, so cooling towers, large roof structures like those we have seen yesterday, are much bigger and would require, definitely, if you use this approach, many more load cases. So we need to try to find a way to reduce it. Can we relate the number of equivalent static wind loads to the complexity of the problem? So the complexity of the structure, I would say, is maybe seven because it has uh, seven spans, or, or maybe just seven because it responds in seven different mode shapes. So why do we need 13 equivalent static wind loads? And in some cases also, it might be difficult to identify the best responses. In this case, it was very easy to say, okay, let's just look at mid-span displacement or uh, bending moment on the supports, but in, in reality that might be much more complicated. And so, uh, for these reasons, perhaps we need to set up again the problem in a right mathematical framework and try to pose it and try to solve it. So if we define the envelope as a generous set of structural responses, so Z max, there would be many of them, right? All displacements everywhere, bending moments everywhere, or actual forces if this is a truss everywhere and try to find the sequence of equivalent forces in such a way that when you run static analysis with them, compute the equivalent displacement, and then from them recombine to get the maximum responses, you could reconstruct the envelope of these, that's the reconstructed envelope. You would like the reconstructed envelope to be as close as possible to the target envelope you had at the beginning. That's exactly the objective of what we want to do. I don't want to interpret this sort of metric in a too strict manner. It could be left with a kind of, uh, with a kind of freedom according to what I said before. All right, so this metric, so the envelope or the reconstruction of the envelope could be discussed with respect to absolute value, relative values. Pay attention that there might be unit issues if you want to combine in the envelope displacement, bending moments, and so forth. Of course, you need metrics to scale them. Uh, we can also consider the, the strengths as has been already discussed. Two constraints. I would like the equivalent forces to be realistic, though they, sh they should look smooth or realistic as a wind uh, uh, loads, equivalent wind loads. And perhaps also the number of wind loads we want to use should not be too large. There is some freedom. I've discussed, discussed about over and underestimation already. So I will just again briefly touch the point, but uh, not too much. All right, so instead of our simple reconstruction based on uh, engineering judgment, what could be done is a sort of uh, adaptive descent solution in which you would start from an initial point. Let's assume we could identify that this response is very important, so we start from there, compute equivalent static loads, see what we have reconstructed, and then look around and see where we did the worst job. And the largest difference between what we would like to reproduce and what we have already re reproduced is over there. So the next one that you will consider for reconstruction is definitely this one. And you can do this in an iterative manner. You understood exactly uh, what I mean. And so this is what you would obtain for the reconstruction rate. Of course, of course it, goes, it goes much faster because uh, we pick at each time the one that is the worst re reconstructed, and so it goes, it goes very fast. 
So what would be the quality of good reconstruction algorithm and bad reconstruction algorithms? The quality of a good reconstruction algorithm is definitely someone that grows very fast and, uh, that starts, and that starts here very high. But the quality also needs to be such that we want to converge to a unit value over here. So I mean, if you increase the set of equivalent forces that you, that you consider, of course you would expect that the whole envelope would be reconstructed. If the convergence value here, the final value here, is not equal to one, or if this is too low, then it means this is a bad, this is a bad sequence. Okay, so uh, I talked again about the, the freedom, so overestimation and underestimation. Let's imagine the design engineer tells you, okay, I want no more than 10 equivalent forces. So you would pick naturally here displacement plus, for instance, bending moment on those supports. So you're left with this, which is unreconstructed. So you could still again call the overestimation, multiply or increase everything by 10% or 20% in order to reproduce a larger envelope. Of course, you reproduce much better the envelope, but this corresponds to overestimation of bending moments, and you will still, however, have some perhaps unacceptable underestimation of the, of the reproduced uh, values. This is something that needs to be discussed typically with a design engineer, because we don't really real, realize this when we, when we are on the wind engineering side, but there is any ways, when you design structures, there's any way some overestimation. At the end of the day, the size of the profile you use needs to be chosen in a certain catalog. All right, and so uh, I would like to touch then uh, the, the solutions that have been given to, to solve this problem in a different manner. Uh, two of them, uh, uh, well, universal wind loads has already been discussed yesterday, so I'm, I'm not planning to spend too much time on that. Uh, not at all, in fact, I don't want to interact. Uh, so I, I will focus on something I, I know a bit more, which is uh, uh, principal static wind loads, uh, which is a concept that uh, came perhaps uh, about 10 years ago. The way it works is that we could collect... Uh, we could collect uh, the set of equivalent static uh, wind loads. And uh, if I look at this one, for instance, this is a static load uh, corresponding to the reproduction of the displacement over here. And this is a static load corresponding to the reproduction of the bending moment over there. We've seen them before. We could do that for any displacement anywhere in the structure or any bending moment anywhere in the structure. And if you do this, you can reproduce like this the collection, okay, line by line, the collection of equivalent forces such that when you apply them, you recover displacement at a given point in the structure. Okay, let's take another example just to make it clear. Uh, if I just slice it over here, just between the two dashed lines, this is the distribution of equivalent forces that would provide the displacement at the mid-span in the uh, last span. Okay, so this is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and last span. And so you see that you would, uh, you would need negative forces over here, positive forces in the following one, and things which are close to the zero to the rest, in the rest of the structure. So that's just nothing but a collection of equivalent static forces for all the responses I'm interested in. So 85 responses and 85 different pressures. Same for the bending moments, 85 bending moments and 85 pressures. We could collect them in a bigger matrix, which is this one, which, corres which corresponds then to the equivalent static forces corresponding to all responses, all right? No matter whether there are displacement or uh, bending moments. And this, in fact, remember this, we've shown this at the very beginning of this talk, this corresponds to the relation between equivalent forces and, uh, and responses. And this is the matrix for which we said mm, this one could create the problem, could be overdetermined, could be fully determined or underdetermined. And so I want to answer just with this uh, matrix, I just want to answer the question of reconstruction of the, of the problem in a different way than using the proper value decomposition of the wind field only, so the CPT decomposition, but instead I'm going to use the POD decomposition of this matrix, which actually covers the full problem. It covers both the dynamics, the response, where you would like to compute the responses. It also includes the, the, the typology of the applied forces. So this is a matrix that actually covers exactly what you would like. And if you do this decomposition, then again, same story. You have principal values, uh, which are ranked from the largest to the smallest on this diagonal here. So you could keep only the first few ones, those that are interesting. 
For each principal value, there is a principal load, so a distribution of forces. And for each distribution of forces, there are responses. So displacement here and bending moments. Example, if we do this for our simple bridge, we actually realize that among the 85 principal static values, among the 85, sorry, principal values, only the first seven values are significant. So it means that we could summarize this all information into a space which has dimension seven only. And the principal static loads are represented here. You can see they are realistic and they totally make sense. So let me call the number of significant principal values, let me call it the complexity. All right, that's the complexity of the problem. We don't have to seek in a space that is larger than seven in dimension in order to solve that problem. If I had done the same exactly for a light pole, I would have realized that only one principal value is enough. Complexity is one. For this one, complexity is two. And for the last one, complexity would be 100, maybe more. All right, so this is a, a super generic method that will write on, tell you how complex the, the structure is and which is able to adapt exactly to what you need. However, we should not believe that the principal static wind loads, so those I've shown over here, are efficient to reconstruct the envelope. They are just the set of forces, such that whenever you combine them, you can recover all equivalent static forces. It doesn't mean they, recover, they, they, they can recover the envelope, because this is a nonlinear problem. All right, demonstration. First principal static load. This is what we recover. Second, third, fourth, and then it doesn't move so much anymore. These are the first seven modes. And so in terms of reconstruction, we see that we start high. OK, so we have a very good start. This is expected, of course, because the first principal static wind load is the one that carries the most important information about equivalent static wind load. So we do a very good job at start. But however, you see that we do not converge uh, very well, and it has a poor terminal reconstruction rate. So there are a few solutions to the problem. Of course, these are open solutions. Everyone is free, of course, to use his own uh, solution to that if you want to start in that way. First, allow some overestimation. So if you increase everything by 20%, this is done, everybody is happy, except perhaps the client, because he will have larger forces to apply on the structure. But that's one solution. Use some principal static wind loads. For instance, here, up to, I would say, half of the complexity. So if complexity is equal to 7, you divide it by 2. That's about 3. And then from there, you see that we do not move anymore. So what you could do is from there is to continue with an adaptive uh, descent, which will allow you to gain and to keep on increasing. OK, so that's one solution. So first use principal static wind loads, and then you complete this set of distribution with something else. Other possibility is to linearly combine the, the principal static wind loads. And this is the solution that I just want to extend a little bit more on during the, the last few minutes we have. Um, let's imagine we have two equivalent static forces, Fe1, Fe2, and uh, let's try to see how it works when we combine them in a linear manner. Why do I tackle that problem? Because I'm planning to combine principal static wind loads, and to make it simple first, I'd just like to understand how it works when I combine equivalent static wind, uh, equivalent static wind loads. W1, W2 are those combination factors. Uh, they range here from minus 2 to 2. And uh, what we can say is that at this point, for instance, you see uh, this is 1, uh, 0. It means that we are at the limit of the overshooting of the envelope. It just means that if W2 is equal to 0, so we just disregard this one, starting from here, if you increase W1, you touch the envelope over here, and then there is overshooting. All right, it makes sense. You just increase the, the, the load that you apply, and you're not allowed to go too large if you want to avoid overshooting. This, the same holds in the other direction, and the set of green points correspond to those combinations of W1, W2, such that we don't overshoot the envelope. This is just a slice. This is just a slice into the whole set of equivalent static wind loads. I could decide to combine, of course, more than two. I could use three, four, five, but it gets a little bit more difficult to illustrate. OK, but in principle, if you want to illustrate this, this is an ellipsoid in a high dimensional space. And the size of this ellipsoid is, is very nasty. The principal axis that you, that you see might be totally different in length. You could, you could want to do the same with the principal static wind loads 
And uh, if you do the same with the principal static wind loads, you would realize that the shape that you obtain is much more isotropic. And uh, it totally makes sense. Again, this is a property of the POD, the decomposition we did before, is to make a shape here that is as isotropic as possible. And this is interesting, especially when you go to higher dimensional spaces, because this circle tends to be a sphere, almost sphere, while the other one tends to be an ellipsoid. And if you want to find optimal solutions in there, this is way easier to do it in a space that has a smart or a simple shape than something that is a little bit more different. How would we reconstruct? So that's the reconstruction rate of the envelope. How would we reconstruct, reconstruct the envelope with combinations? Well, if you use W1, W2 both equal to zero, of course it means zero force, you don't reconstruct anything. If you use uh, one zero, that's the combination we have seen before, that's about 30% reconstruction. Uh, same here, it's a little bit better, so it means we should have started with a second mode, a second response instead of the first. But this is how you would reconstruct uh, the envelope. And uh, you see that with the principal static wind loads, we can reach larger values, especially in this range. But again, uh, think that this is just a slice in a hyper-dimensional hyper space. And we could reach even much larger values in a very simple manner if we combine the complexity. So if we combine the number of principal static wind loads corresponding to complexity, so seven, just the number of principal loads that we need to use in order to reproduce the response, we could find them in this way, I have used a random uh, walk approach in, in this seven-dimension space, which is something that is not so complicated with respect to everything I've seen in AI these days. Um, and it gives me optimum value for the combination of the first seven principal static wind loads that would reconstruct the envelope. This is the first combination I see for the distribution. This is the reconstructed displacement and bending moment. This is what I have with the second. This is what I have with the third. And you see that now displacement, before we needed seven load cases, now with three only, we did already a very good job. And of course, again, I said this problem is very simple. That's much more impressive when you work with much more complex structures. And if you work with a set of 10 uh, combinations, you see that the displacement are reconstructed very fast and the bending moments also very fast. What's the interest of this method? Uh, this is interesting because you can provide to the client or to the design engineer a minimum number of sets. And on top of that, you would provide him or her combination coefficients. And this is something design engineers are used to. They would like to have a small amount of information with regards to load cases, but they are really uh, used to combine them in a very simple manner. All right. So... That was a solution of the, uh, the, the, the reconstruction of the envelope uh, problem. So now we need to look a little bit further away and see, OK, uh, what did we miss? What did I talk about? And how could we apply this to a real structure? So those structures you're interested in, they cover large roofs, silos, cooling towers, bridges, so structures that are definitely much more complex than what I've talked about today. Uh, I want to say that I covered only today one part of the problem, but we could extend. Uh, it's already partly done, but not totally. We could extend to non-symmetric envelope. We could di discuss the way the envelope is computed. Uh, we could also discuss what happens when there are several wind incidences. So part of those problems have been solved, but not totally. If you're interested, then uh, just please knock at my door, and I would be happy to discuss those questions with you. We could also see beyond buffeting. And, uh, and see how we could combine engineering solutions compared to AI in order to solve the future structures which also have been imagined with uh, AI. All right, so before closing my talk, I would like to thank uh, all the people with whom I've been working over the last years. And uh, that was a real pleasure to work with you, and thanks to you. I think we could reach ma maturity in, uh, in solving these problems. Uh, this is possible not only because of scientific collaborations, but also uh, some funding and, uh, and industrial partners. Um, and so, um, just before closing, uh, just about this keynote lecture, I would like to know that it's available for you if you want. I've understood it will be available on a YouTube uh, channel, so if you want to revisit again what we've said this morning, then uh, feel free to do it. Uh, it's available if you want to include it if, in your summer courses, if you want. It would require, however, some additional material about uh, universal wind loads, definitely. Some additional stuff about principal uh, static wind loads, but also purple skin modes. 
uh, the equivalent spectral model is something that also has been uh, designed in order to address the same questions and definitely more realistic applications, which, had, which I had no time to cover over here. Uh, perhaps this material could be also used. That was my first uh, aim, is to use this material in order to prepare some sort of review or state of art paper, which could be submitted somewhere, but uh, let's see what the future will, will tell us. All right, so this closes this talk. Uh, thank you very much. So we've discussed these two questions, so I think it will be time to discuss them in a few minutes. Thank you very much.